colleague, Claire Kelly, who is a consultant with us. Um, we'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, um, Moving from Conflict to Consensus Between Public Boards and Hospital Boards. Um, unfortunately, um, having a high conflict uh, situation uh, between uh, the, the um, nonprofit board and the county or district board that might own the facility is an all too common occurrence. And uh, what Claire and I wanna share with you today are some um, approaches and tools that we have found, this is at Stroudwater, to be successful in navigating that conflict and emerging on the other side with a successful outcome for the local healthcare delivery system. Um, and we'll have some examples to share with you as well. Um, by way of education, we'll share a little bit of background on national healthcare market trends, and then we'll spend some time talking about some of the unique uh, aspects of county and district-owned hospitals and how that adds some complexity and a challenge to charting a course for the future and achieving consensus and buy-in. What are some of the strategic considerations behind the need to have a consensus and a shared vision? How do we get there? Um, and then really specifically, what are some of the tactics, tools, and approaches that Stroudwater has found in our practice uh, working with county district-owned hospitals, sometimes at the behest of the county or district, sometimes at the behest of the 501c3 that often is leasing the hospital uh, from the county or district, and um, sometimes at the behest of both entities and our thoughts and reactions to that. Um, Reviewing what is going on in healthcare today, it is a uh, highly uncertain, highly dynamic environment, one that is um, characterized by considerable disruption. A lot of different factors, many of which continue to uh, roil the waters uh, for years. Um, the ones I, I wanna focus on with this slide really are around the impacts of COVID, um, which has introduced a significant degree of uncertainty uh, it's disrupted volumes. It's created a tremendous opportunity for telemedicine as an alternative option. Um, it's created severe financial uh, impacts that have been mitigated um, um, by relief funds. Um, the question there is um, how permanent is that relief and how, uh, the, how long the duration of the impacts from COVID uh, will continue to affect the delivery system. So understanding that interplay is a challenge. Um, market consolidation and new entrants remains an ongoing uh, concern. Uh, and some of this is, is amplified by the movement from care from the inpatient or acute hospital setting uh, to outpatient facilities and in some instances, uh, provider and physician offices. So that evolution has also introduced additional competition but then you see new entrants, Aetna CVS, Walmart Humana, and Haven, which is the venture uh, from Amazon, Berkshire, and JP Morgan, all creating the potential for significant disruption in the healthcare delivery space. Um, all of this is going on with a much heightened consumer environment where consumers actually have data and increasingly the ability to compare prices um, between providers but very much bringing a retail convenience um, a mindset to their choices in terms of uh, which providers they, they utilize. The last item is something that's been going on for more than a decade, but, but the advent of high deductible health plans and um, really making the, the consumer, the patient, um, the arbiter of value um, and looking at um, cost because folks now have significant exposure to provider costs. Um, one of the, uh, the effects of high deductible health plans has been an increase in bad debt uh, in some markets. And certainly it's, it's worth noting that um, the duration of a um, recession um, and changes in employment and health insurance coverage could have significant adverse effects on bad debt going forward. Um, thinking about high deductible health plans here, very, powerful graphic from um, uh, Kaiser 
um, looking at um, the growth and proliferation of high deductible health plans. And again, when you have a significant portion of your patients that have that kind of exposure and may have situations where their hours have been curtailed, maybe their pay has been, been reduced, or even worse, they've, they've lost their job, um, the exposure to bad debt is is uh, likely to be a significant factor uh, for any future recession, just as we saw during the Great Recession. One of the significant headwinds that's been a real challenge for the industry uh, has been Medicare reimbursement and the level of payment. Uh, using MedPAR data and the MedPAR annual report to Congress, we've developed this, this trend of uh, how Medicare uh, payments uh, translate into hospital margins. And you can see after hitting a peak around 2013, those margins have, have decreased significantly um, until they began to rebound a little bit in 2017. Uh, but even with the rebound in 2018 and projected uh, margins through 2020, um, when you look at the not-for-profit um, and all hospital averages, they remain significantly negative and significantly off um, prior to the 2013 recent uh, peak in terms of payment relative to cost uh, for Medicare. This is a significant headwind for the industry and a challenge going forward, especially in markets that trend older rural uh, areas um, and uh, places that are not fast growing metro or suburban areas tend to have these, the older populations well, you'll have a higher incidence of Medicare uh, payment. Um, so all of these factors come together in a challenging view. What's interesting is the rating agencies had a positive outlook for the industry for the year before COVID hit. Uh, in our estimation, that positive outlook was built on some fairly transient factors and the fundamentals, long-term fundamentals were, were gonna remain challenging. That being said, their outlook is based for the year in front of us. Um, after COVID hit, the rating agencies all came back with revised outlooks for the industry. And um, it's important to note that um, rating agencies expect significant impacts on cash flow, um, impacts on elective surgeries, uh, having an outsized impact on uh, profit um, for organizations. And the rating agencies have, have subsequently, as a result of these factors, change their outlook for 2020 to negative. Um, rating agencies also mentioned the impact on operating costs um, and um, the adverse impact on liquidity and reserves. Um, you know, we're seeing health systems of size um, noting that they're gonna have losses of a half billion dollars um, as a result of COVID. Um, and, and the real uncertainty around this, the, the duration, location, and severity of the disruption still being uncertain. We see these, these uh, evolving uh, outbreaks throughout the country. And um, clearly, on a national basis, there's been a disruption of utilization um, and a, a, a major transition for how people access and think about accessing healthcare. So that continues to be, to be an issue uh, going forward. So some of these COVID impacts, um, telemedicine had significant increases in utilization. Uh, anecdotally, what we're hearing is, is that's rebounded closer to what it was, but, but not there. Talking recently to a primary care physician group and uh, their telemedicine had, had grown significantly, um, um, actually more than doubling during the peak surge and remains about double what it was. So going from about 10% of visit volume pre-COVID to about 20% of visit volume for that particular practice uh, at the current um, uh, state of affairs. Um, a lot of uncertainty about what the next phase and the new normal looks like um, uh, for health systems going forward. We've mentioned the delay, delayed elective surgeries and the, the longer term impact of disrupted chronic condition management preventive care um, is one that is of concern, I know, to many uh, healthcare providers who care for those patients. Um, one of the things we've seen nationally, many of our clients, is this shot of, of liquidity that came from the PPP program for smaller um, health systems under 500 employees, CARES Act relief, 
um, and other sources has been a huge improvement in many ways to the liquidity position of these organizations. Um, the real question is, how durable is that? Will that enhanced liquidity get eaten up by disruptions uh, to uh, services and the cancellation of elective surgeries? We had a, a client of ours in the, the Southeast who had returned to doing elective surgeries and then after six weeks or so had to, uh, by the order of the state, cease doing elective surgeries because there had been a uh, spike in, in COVID in, in the state. Uh, and so the, the disruption and the effects are really uh, unknown at this point. Um, and then thinking, as I mentioned before, longer term, if we don't have this uh, V recovery, uh, and it, it appears that that's not in the offing uh, at this point, or at least the optimistic version of that V recovery is not in the offing, what are the longer term effects on employment, insurance coverage, bad debt exposure, and importantly, the social determinants of health uh, in many of these communities. Uh, so longer term health needs uh, increasing uh, as a result of changes in local economies and um, social infrastructure. All of this is going on amidst a, a crisis of healthcare in this country where we've seen an epidemic of closures. Uh, and you can see um, there certainly are clusters, the southeastern and southwestern United States having significant number of closures. Uh, California also experiencing um, a, a fair number of closures, although relative to the population of the state, uh, maybe not as big an outlier as visually it appears here. One of the factors um, and, and reactions to the challenges we've, we've covered with you today has been consolidation with uh, uh, community hospitals, rural hospitals looking for system partners to help address some of the, the regulatory complexity, operating complexity, bringing economies of skill and scale to the table to help. Uh, and then larger, uh, on a larger scale, um, larger organizations coming together as well to try to capture some of those economies of, of scale. Um, uh, likely to be an ongoing trend. Um, those two, two factors, the closures where the industry is in distress and, and stressed in many instances, also uh, resulting in continued consolidation going forward. I do think when we think about the impacts of COVID on systems, it's clearly had uh, an impact where they're very focused on core um, markets, core business, and uh, don't want to get distracted by uh, doing something that's out of market and perhaps uh, less of a core strategic priority. So there have been some impacts um, in terms of what that consolidation model looks like. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Claire to spend a little time with you all on some specifics about um, county and district owned hospitals. So as just said, I'm going to talk about the unique nature of county and district owned hospitals. And when it comes to hospital ownership, County and district-owned hospitals certainly make for an interesting dynamic. Anytime you have more than one board weighing in on an important strategic decision when it comes to a hospital, leaves room for error. When these errors are subject to public scrutiny and public debate via the press, it can really wreak havoc on the reputation of your hospital and make it difficult to retain and recruit members to your board and within your organization. On top of all of this, you have county and district owned hospitals. They have to deal with the rules and regulations that are subject to both of their boards. So that can lead to some issues regarding, for example, expansion issues where some government owned hospital systems aren't permitted to really expand outside their county or district boundary. It can lead to bankruptcy issues where in some areas, authority owned hospitals can't file for bankruptcy. And it can even lead to state issues, such as states that have sunshine or open meeting laws, which is where um, county and district owned boards are subject to being open to the public and can have press invited to these meetings, which makes it very difficult to have private strategic sessions to talk about the future of an organization without your local market competition finding out or having an idea of what direction you're working towards. And you can also have tax issues because county and district owned hospitals are a public asset. 
So if you have eroding operating performance, that creates financial exposure for a lot of taxpayers. And you can also have tax support actually masking the financial and operating performance of an organization. All this to say that county and district-owned hospitals are a community business. They involve multiple stakeholders in the community and they can become a large source of debate. So some key takeaways from this are that when you have multiple boards, you're going to have multiple stakeholders and most likely that's going to lead to some conflicting opinions. An example of this is if you have a county board who they want to be good stewards in their community. They want to do what's best for the community and in that manner, they want to have an influence and some authority of what goes on at the hospital. Meanwhile, the hospital board can look at that and think the, the county board is really more of a landlord position and that can create consensus and or miscommunication and really create overlapping governance issues where no board is really clear on their responsibilities. And that's not to say that either board is in the wrong. They want to do what's best for their community and they want to push their community forward, but it can really lead to some public scrutiny if there isn't unity behind these decisions being made. Boards are also subject to additional layers of review if your county or district owned, and in some types of partnerships, they can be subject to additional approvals. So it's really important to have smooth channels of communication established between your leadership on both boards because buy-in from both boards is really essential to move forward in an efficient manner to get some strategic direction. So this leads us into key strategic considerations. At Stroudwater, we like to say that time is never a neutral factor. Hospitals and health organizations are facing increasing federal and industry-wide headwinds, as well as increased local market competition. And what that's doing is it's creating, there's really no, a do-nothing model is not going to suffice to help these organizations move forward. So, for example, if an organization is on stable footing and is having stable operating performance, their strategic options open to them are going to be much wider and more broad than the strategic options open to an organization that has an eroding operating performance. So when your operating performance erodes, so does the strategic options available to you. In another way, in another essence, time is also super important in terms of getting your strategic decisions done efficiently and approaching your strategic options efficiently. We had a client that was in the middle of an affiliation process and towards, you know, they were working on their definitive agreement. And while they were doing that, they had a malpractice lawsuit come up. So time, the longer something takes, you have these barriers that are going to prevent deals from getting done. Luckily, that wasn't the case for this client, but it did create a substantial barrier that the client had to negotiate through and deal with, with their potential partner. So the longer a deal goes on, the longer uh, it takes to make a strategic decision, the more opportunities you're giving for barriers to pop up. However, it's important to understand that when you're making these strategic decisions, there's no decision that doesn't involve an element of risk associated with it. So if you choose to remain independent, that's gonna have strategic risks associated with it. If you choose to affiliate or partner anywhere, anywhere along the affiliation or partnership scale, whether that's joint venture or full on asset purchase agreement, there are going to be risks associated with that as well. It's really important that as an organization, you take the time to understand what is A, your organization capable of taking on in terms of risk? What is your organization be willing to take on in terms of risk? And understanding where that sits with the board and how you're gonna move forward and mitigate those risks together as a unit. But in order to mitigate those risks, you really have to understand the dynamics at play between risks. We like to put risks into four categories, financial risks, operating risks, market risks, and value risks. And in each of those categories, we have numerous indicators that are indicators of risk and we can evaluate on an individual scale. It's important to note that if one indicator is not doing well or is having a downfall, it's going to probably have spillover and crossover effect into other indicators within other categories because this is a integrated market. So for example, if you have a hospital that has declining market share, that's going to probably affect the volume of that organization. It's going to affect the revenue, cash flow, operating margin, et cetera. So it's extremely important to examine these risks over time and understand trends that are happening within your organization. 
And to note that to mitigate or come up with solutions to these risks also takes time. A Band-Aid solution is not going to happen overnight. You need a long-term solution that's going to be sustainable for your organization. And sometimes that can take a couple years to really show. This is an example of a strategic risk scorecard that we like to use to show hospitals and hospital boards and county district boards where their organization falls on this strategic risk scale. So we look at each individual risk category and then the indicators within those categories and examine each indicator to see how they're doing to give that category an overall risk score, which we then combine the four risk score, the four categories risk scores together to give your organization an overall risk score. And again, this is a great way to establish a really common objective fact base for the boards and your organization to come together and understand how the organization is doing, not only internally, but also in the local market and sometimes even in the federal market. Accompanying this risk. We had a, a, just a comment there. One of the unique factors um, that's a complexity with, with county and district on hospitals is it, even if for instance, the hospital board has a good appreciation of what the risk profile of the organization is. The county or district board may not, or vice versa. And so not only do you have the difficulty of appreciating what the risk profile is and how it may evolve, and those changes can be very subtle, and but cumulative over time. But if you've got two different boards that have overlapping um, governance responsibility and feel an obligation to um, make sure that that operation and asset are viable and sustainable going forward, but they don't have the same appreciation of what the risk profile is. Very difficult to, to have consensus um, and, a, and a shared future or, or idea of what that shared future should look like between those boards. Exactly. Each board needs to trust the data that's coming to them and have a mutual understanding of what that data and what that analysis is telling them. Accompanying that risk score, we also like to give a financial risk score or really show the operating performance of a hospital or organization over time. And we do this by using our survive, sustain, and thrive model, which examines the organization's EBITDA and looks at, okay, does this EBITDA meet the survive line, which is really covering an organization's debt service? Does it meet the sustain line, which is covering the debt service of an organization with 120% depreciation ex expenses or does it meet the Thrive line where it's meeting that your debt service, your 120% of your depreciation expenses and 4% of your operating expenses? Really, when an organization should start to evaluate its strategic options, it's best to do it when you're above that sustain line, when you're above that orange line, because you're going to have many more strategic options open and available to you than when you start falling underneath that sustain line and eroding the options available to you with that operating performance. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, so as we start to think about um, moving from uh, conflict to consensus and how that works, we thought it might be helpful to share uh, some perspectives of a couple of communities that uh, we've worked in. Um, first, again, one of the, the attributes of strategic planning in an environment where there's uncertainty is, you know, these are calculated uh, um, and, and approximations of what the right uh, decision should be. So to quote Peter Drucker, there's no perfect strategic decision. One always has to pay a price. One always has to balance conflicting objectives, conflicting opinions, and conflicting priorities. The best strategic decision is only an approximation and a risk. If you have two different boards who do not have good communication, uh, don't have a high level of trust, um, who have a different appreciation of what the organization's risk profile is, very, very difficult to get consensus on what that right strategic direction is when both, both boards probably are fully cognizant that there are trade-offs. And so it's very easy to slip into a mindset where every decision becomes a zero-sum game. If it benefits the hospital, then the county or district is losing or vice versa as opposed to what is the shared um, uh, um, objective between those boards. So um, in recent years, we've had the privilege of working in two different communities. Um, and to borrow uh, some of the, 
the verbiage from the movie It's a Wonderful Life, you may recall um, the, the bad outcome if, if um, the Jimmy Stewart character uh, had not been around would have been that uh, the community was known as Pottersville and old man Potter would have owned everything in town. Um, but the good outcome with Jimmy Stewart, uh, his character there was Bedford Falls was a vibrant uh, community and, and one that was uh, successful and, and um, um, a great place to live. Um, there really is a real Pottersville in this example. And unfortunately, um, we had a, a hospital district and a hospital board, long uh, uh, track record of conflict, actually personal conflict between the, the hospital CEO and the chair of the uh, district. Um, and that characterized uh, everything. Uh, everything. Uh, no shared process. Working relationship with the boards was, uh, I think it'd be fair to say toxic. High level of distrust, high level of conflict. Um, as a result of uh, each board having its own advisor, no shared vision for the future. And ultimately what happened, uh, you know, in, in many of these cases is if you litigate it and, and cut to the chase, there is one entity that ultimately has the ultimate authority to uh, make decisions or, or, or enact uh, kind of a unilateral vision of the future. In this case, the district had that power and authority. It enacted that. Um, it was very disruptive. Uh, ultimately, uh, a year or so later, the hospital declared bankruptcy, um, continued ongoing controversy, uh, closed clinic locations, terminated services, and a lot of um, destruction of value and disruption of a critical community asset. They did secure a new partner at kind of fair fire sale distressed terms. So they didn't get a, a great outcome for the community, but the district won, uh, if, if you can put that in air quotes, at a tremendous loss. It was a, really a, 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 a pyrrhic victory, uh, to use that term. Different community, different approach, and happily a different outcome. And we, again, we work with both of these communities. In this case, um, district board, hospital board, they actually engaged a community foundation in the process as well, but they had one advisor for those boards. Um, they convened a shared process with a joint committee uh, to look at a common set of facts. They were able to arrive at consensus and replace conflict and distrust with that consensus and a good working relationship. So they were able to get buy-in uh, instead of controversy. One of the things they did was had a very open, very public process um, that really allowed them to engage the community at a very different, from a very different perspective than the historic perspective. Um, they were able to arrive at a shared vision, focus on achieving objectives that benefited the community. Uh, and as a result of this process and coming up with that shared consensus vision, they were able to attract a very high quality partner on very attractive terms. Um, so a major investment back into the community from the partner, um, community confidence in the local healthcare delivery system has soared, and the district, because they've been able to bring in this partner, has been able to now allocate community resources uh, uh, away from um, the hospital uh, and, and um, towards community needs that are health-related, to be sure, but are maybe behavioral health and uh, um, having folks that have difficulty accessing care uh, be able to access care. So the, the point here is, yes, it's possible uh, in this one case for the district to have won, and doubtless in the Bedford Falls example, had the district taken that approach, they also had the ultimate authority to win. Um, but it's real hard to get that um, positive outcome for the community when the focus is on winning as opposed to let's do what's right for the community. Uh, what is that shared vision? What is the best way to realize that for the benefit of the community? So a very stark contrast uh, in outcome for those two communities. And I think there's some real lessons to be learned there. Um, so from Stradwater's perspective, as we've worked around the country in communities of all types and with, with healthcare organizations of all types, many of which are county or district owned, 
um, or authority um, owned, um, many of which are not. Um, there are some takeaways, um, and the takeaways being, you know, communication between, at, at a minimum, board leadership, having that working relationship, um, creating some sort of shared venue for the, the at least board leadership or designees of the board to get together and address and tackle issues and discuss issues. So you start to build that trust. There's communication, there's uh, back and forth and interplay there. Um, I, I, I will say, I think it can be very hard to overcome uh, entrenched points of view without the benefit of, of expertise and perspective from other communities and how they've been able to move beyond conflict. And so outside expert facilitation that can uh, help develop, and, and this is step four, a common fact base. That is, you know, the, the classic statement, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. And what we want to do as part of a process is drain the emotion uh, out, of, out of the room and replace it with, with understanding and appreciation for what the objective facts and situation says um, about the future and the, the current condition of the delivery system, what is required to move forward. So really uh, important to, via that facilitation, expert facilitation, get that common fact base in front of um, the, the joint committee if you have one, but certainly ultimately in front of both boards. What you really want to avoid is each board having its own set of facts, because then all of your energy and time is going to be spent translating or rebutting the facts um, that don't agree, as opposed to focusing on what, what is really important for the future of healthcare in the community. Um, enabling folks not to dwell on the past, not to relitigate issues uh, and, and fight prior turf wars, but um, rally around a shared vision for the future, really important. Uh, and so if, if you're going to um, tell folks, we're, we're not going to spend all of our time relitigating the past, it's important to say why and, and what the benefit is for the community. Uh, going forward. And that shared vision is a really critical step there. The last point, uh, and there's various uh, approaches within this, but it's really critical that uh, any community that has conflict and distrust between the hospital and the district or county uh, or authority board um, have a real commitment to communication, open communication, consistent communication that is really clear about what the objectives are and 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 why we're we're doing what we're doing, what the goal is to benefit the community. If, if you don't do that, you're never able to get beyond the distrust and the cynicism that often exists in a community when you've got two boards that are very publicly um, fighting or in conflict with each other and oftentimes highly critical of one another. So you have to, you have to move uh, beyond that and you have to give folks uh, information that they can um, process and get comfortable that this is not the same old, same old, that this reflects uh, a new approach and a new direction for um, charting the course for healthcare delivery in the community. Claire, I believe it's yours. So as Jeff's emphasized, it's really important to ensure frequent communication between board leadership and make sure that your leadership from both boards have established a dialogue and a strong communication channel to really kind of start to start to come over and, and get beyond that distrust that could have happened in the past. And usually this creates a mutual understanding of how each board operates and how each board functions and the dynamics that go on within each board. And ways to do this are to have quarterly meetings with you know, the senior leadership on both boards to sit down and discuss issues and give them a chance to really address questions and concerns that may have come up in each other's meetings or actually in public debate and public discussion. And also inviting leaders of different boards to come and examine and sit in on different board meetings, especially around strategic and long range planning is really beneficial because it gives them an opportunity to see how decisions are made in the other board and to understand the key personalities at play on these different boards and how that's going to operate. This just builds a, a channel of communication and a channel of trust to start to get beyond what may have happened in the past and really move forward into understanding that what they want for the community and to benefit the community is really the same thing. 
So, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, establishing this shared venue, um, and by shared venue, we mean creating a, it, it could be something informal, um, it, it, you know, cognizant of uh, open meeting laws and not having uh, a quorum present or, or, or those types of issues. But if it's a regular commitment for um, um, board leadership to get together to discuss issues, that works. It, it could also be um, if there is a, a, a specific agenda or goal in mind, we want to create a new strategic plan. We've got um, some really pressing strategic issues that we, we want both boards to be engaged around actually creating a, a joint committee or a task force or working group that has membership of both boards, perhaps some additional community stakeholders. But you want to create a forum um, where uh, issues can be discussed, where members of both boards can reach consensus on key issues um, and, and establish that working relationship. So it's, it's really important that, that this occur. Um, again, when we, we talk about a shared venue, you certainly want key uh, members of, of the respective boards there. These are folks that will need to be able to explain and vouch for the work of the committee back to the respective board. So you want folks that are in leadership roles and are viewed as, as credible um, and, and honest brokers. Um, it may be important to have additional stakeholders. One of the examples we gave, there was a significant philanthropic uh, undertaking in history in the community. And so it was important to engage those philanthropic leaders as part of the process, as well as some additional um, oftentimes, as well as engaging some additional representatives, maybe from the provider community and maybe from the broader community as well, that can bring um, um, perspectives and perhaps influence more broadly to the process. Um, so that's that's really uh, uh, critical. Um, I do think it's also important that if you create a joint committee, that um, the committee be be allowed to make a recommendation to go back to the boards, assuming that there's a specific set of issues that are being tackled. Um, you know, it, 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 that uh, is an important device for making this a recommendation that the boards take under consideration, uh, as opposed to uh, the committee works and both boards uh, rip up the work of the committee and go off and do, do their own agenda. So um, there's, a, there's some, some nuances and technical aspects of the process that need to be very thoughtfully uh, undertaken. You can see the quote here, which I think is great. Uh, and it, it just, it's obvious, but it speaks volumes. Anytime you have two entities with somewhat overlapping responsibilities, there's always a potential for conflict. And the, the comment that Claire and I and other colleagues have heard over and over again from the hospital uh, board will often hear, why is the district the authority or, um, the county meddling in the operations of the hospital. Um, they're the landlord. Let us run the business. That's what we're here to do. And from the county district uh, authority perspective, um, they will say, listen, we, we're stewards of this vital uh, community asset. We, we do have a vested interest and concern if there's some decisions being made that will destroy the value of that asset or impair its ability to serve the community. So you get this, these, these overlapping, uh, really highly uh, aligned sets of concerns, but that create conflict um, once they're applied and people um, start thinking about how to apply those um, in, in, a, in a real world setting. Um, outside facilitation, we've discussed this before. Um, I, I would just say, really reiterate one point here. Um, the Pottersville example we gave earlier, the district board and the hospital board each had an advisor and they the, the boards talked right by each other. Both advisors were expert. Uh, both advisors looked at the same situation, but the fact base was different for both entities. And so there really was never any opportunity for uh, a, a good opportunity for consensus in that example. It was really a, a missed opportunity. In the Bedford Falls example, with the really positive outcome, the decision had been made to overcome the conflict and distrust and have a shared process, have a single outside facilitator to help them 
uh, move beyond the conflict, that that facilitator would not have a vested interest in advancing the agenda of one entity or the other, and that could bring a national perspective to the decisions that need to be made in the community. And that's that's part of the value proposition and the critical uh, nature. So as Jeff and I have touched on, in terms of establishing this common fact base, it goes back to what we talked about earlier when it comes to strategic risks and really replacing that emotion that would have been between those two boards with a set of objective facts about how their organization is doing, where their organization sits within the local market, and how their organization is sitting within a federal or industry-wide market. And replacing that emotion with these facts helps a two boards move forward, especially if you have a joint committee that's facilitating this and running the show. It helps really put everyone on the same page and pull information from the same source. And you can really do this by, again, engaging your outside advisor and making sure you're addressing performance gaps, strategic and operational risks within your organization, and key trends over you know, the last three to five years. It's also important to look at what your organization is doing well, along with what your organization could improve on, because it's good to know what you're doing well, what you're succeeding at, and why you're succeeding in those areas versus why you're not in some others. And having both boards understand that gives an overall perspective about where this organization can go and how that organization can move forward. And when you establish a common fact base, it's a really great way to launching and a launching point to establish a shared vision or a set of what we like to call strategic objectives. And usually there are a set of about 10 strategic objectives that really serve as the goals of the organization moving forward. And the special joint committee will establish this and be the final say in what uh, strategic, strategic objectives get approved and bring that back to each of their individual boards. But it creates this unifying goal to move forward for both boards and for the special joint committee. And it also creates a set of talking points for the boards to use if they have these things to, con to continually refer back to in terms of if they're being asked in the press or being asked in the public to have a set of unified goals and to have a set of unified talking points really helps reinstate and reinforce in the public eye that everyone is on the same page and that everyone is moving forward towards the same destination and same vision in the future. And typically this process works as your retained advisor will look at your common fact base and will establish a set of drafts out of strategic objectives, which will then be brought to the special joint committee and special joint committee will rank these objectives and understand and kind of understand and, and analyze what strategic objectives need to be where within that list and then finalize and approve them and bring them back to their individual boards to use throughout the process. Thanks, Claire. Um, so the final point in, in this list um, is implementing and executing on a communications plan. Um, and so when um, a hospital board and a county or district or authority board uh, engage in a joint planning process. It's, it's really important given what might be a decade or more of distrust and, and adverse relationships to communicate very clearly what, what the joint committee or task force is hoping to achieve, the issues they're looking at, um, and the process that will, will uh, result um, it is certainly possible when you when you outline a process to anticipate where some important milestones for communication will be and be proactive about communicating uh, with stakeholders uh, within the organization and certainly external stakeholders in the community. So, so really important to be proactive there. What we often do um, as part of our team is actually integrate a communication specialist is, is part of our team who then works very closely if, if our client has a communications pro with them um, to both design and then help execute uh, the communication strategy. Claire mentioned uh, in her discussion strategic objectives where we're really defining three, five years and longer down the road, what are some of the key things that folks want to achieve? Uh, the components of that shared vision, if you will. And um, those objectives really become an important communication tool. So depending upon what process or what the issues are that you're discussing, there may be points in time where you really can't say a lot until you're, you're further along in the process. Um, but it's important to reassure people as to 
what's guiding the decision making of the, the task force or the boards related to um, the issues at hand and um, what is the focal point um, of, of the work. So that can be um, really, really critical. In situations where there's been a lot of distrust and a lot of accusations made, the natural result of that is cynicism. And so I think one piece of advice we would give folks is depending upon the, the level of cynicism and prior conflict, uh, it may require a much more open communications approach than you otherwise might might do. Uh, and it really is situation specific um, and, and also state specific. States have different requirements um, in terms of sunshine laws and what's required to communicate um, as we've, we've seen around the country. So all of those are, are key, key points, but that clear, consistent, and internally when you're living a process like this, it will seem as if the communication is repetitive, but to folks who are stakeholders and not living the process, that communication is not repetitive. It's, it's absolutely vital. Um, and so um, really, really important to make sure we, we um, hit on that. I apologize, I, I advanced beyond things here. Um, so a couple of points to make. You can see some really, um, I think, great quotes from a hospital board. Uh, this is the Bedford Falls example and the chairman of the hospital district. Uh, this is a community that was textbook, more than a decade of very public, uh, in the local media, charge, counter charge, um, all sorts of innuendo and, and attacks that fueled discussion, political agendas, personal agendas. And they were fortunate in um, the, the chair of the, the hospital had been in place for a few years and they had a new chair of the hospital district board who really took advantage of the opportunity to begin to forge a working relationship uh, across to um, their counterpart and develop that working relationship and then articulate and, and co-develop a process that the boards could could engage in um, to chart the future for healthcare delivery. And so, you know, they had a shared open process, a single facilitator, um, very good public communication, um, and, and really did things extremely well. And it was uh, definitely kind of a trust fall because the relationship and the media coverage had been so excessively negative for so long to actually have an open public process was a, a, a huge challenge and a huge leap of faith for them. Uh, and they took that leap of faith and it, it paid off dividends for them because they, they were confident that if they kept their focus on doing the right thing and keeping the community's needs at the forefront, that ultimately that would win the day over prior uh, cynicism and the track record that it had existed. So um, some nice encouragement there. Um, Claire and I want to make sure we've got uh, 10, 12 minutes here that we um, uh, entertain questions. So uh, if, if folks have questions, I know uh, Benson Gray, who is our IT director who kicked us off here, um, monitors that. I don't know, Benson, if you have uh, any any questions that have come in. Actually, we did have a question already, and the, it was regarding what are really the suggested first steps? You know, how do you... What are the what are the baby steps? How do you crawl out of a, a hole like this? Um, well, so I, I would go back and we kind of have this this set of recommendations of a six step approach. And and the thing that's that's um, a prerequisite, I think, for any successful process is uh, that working relationship and communication at uh, it could be just start with the board leadership uh, and and beginning to break down some of those barriers so that that communication is critical. And then I think creating that working relationship between the boards, that shared venue, however that's done, if it's done informally or if it's more formally via joint committee or task force, um, those become the, the really critical first steps because once you've done that, it starts facilitating um, problem solving and joint con consensus around, here's how we could move forward. So I think those are really indispensable. From those two steps, everything else flows. And, and frankly, if you don't have um, board leadership that's willing to invest that time and communicate and trust, 
you 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 really um, you know frankly are facing a, a huge uphill battle. The the flip side of the question, um, you know, where would you start? Um, I guess I, I would ask a, a negative question just to provide some additional guidance, and that is, you know, what is if if, if we've done those two things right, we've we've started to communicate and build a working relationship amongst the board leadership, and we we've created or are thinking about creating a, a shared venue. Where can this go wrong? And what I would say is, it, it can go wrong if um, either or both boards decide to retain a facilitator outside of a shared process. Um, and so then you have a, a different set of facts that, you know, frankly may disrupt the process. Um, it's important to get an objective facilitator who'll put the right facts objectively in front of decision makers. But if you have um, each board has its own facilitator advisor, it becomes exceedingly difficult at that point in a process um, for there to be consensus um, uh, and, and arrive at that shared vision and, and build the trust. So the first two steps, um, that, that communication and working relationship with board leadership and a shared venue. And then I guess the flip side of that, I would say really avoid Having, having each board have its own advisor if you if can at all, because it will quickly get bogged down in um, competing narratives and competing sets of facts. I would agree with that and just really reiterate that having a communication between your senior leadership, whether that's, you know, just having a quick meeting 15 minutes over coffee, you know, once a month to really understand these issues, that's just going to build trust over time, which is going to make things go much smoother in the future. I would really emphasize that. All right, and thank you very much. Another question about interaction with the press, the need and balancing privacy versus transparency, and as you already mentioned, some of the uh, the sunshine laws and such. Yeah, I would say that's really a balancing act between kind of understanding what you can share and what you can engage with your stakeholders, um, which means you sometimes we'll have to be more open with the press and more open with the public than you were previously. But again, if you are united behind those strategic objectives and if the press is going to different members of different boards and they're still getting the same feedback and still getting the same communication and still getting those same strategic objectives, that's gonna put a lot more faith in the community that you're actually moving forward and united as a whole and really trying to achieve something that's better for the community or move forward with your organization. I also think it's equally as important to understand from both boards what is private information and what needs to be held close to the chest and not shared with the public. And having a clear understanding of what's going on there is really key because you don't want something slipping out that's really not approved. So again, that really comes into having strong communication points of what exactly can be shared, but sharing enough that it's, you know, you're not hiding what you're doing for the community. And I would just add to that um, what Claire said that, you know, many of our clients do have a communications or um, marketing um, resource on their team, which is, which is great. Um, what we think is important is bringing the perspective and the experience of having gone through these processes and anticipating where um, some of the, the real communication needs are, and then you know, working collaboratively um, to you know maximize um, the opportunities for good press. You know, so if there is a local weekly paper um, and there's an opportunity to get um, a, a good story or a story in that, you know, working with their publication schedule um, for that coverage, as opposed to maybe doing a daily paper that might be in a larger metro area that, that covers a local community. So, uh, you know, thinking about some of those trade-offs and who are some of the key um, outlets and, and, and evaluating those working relationships. So having that local knowledge of, of from the, the management team is, is absolutely vital. And then marrying that up with some of the, the expertise from, you know, folks on our team who've been through this process uh, and, and understand, you know, communications. I, I, I'm not a communications expert, um, but um, those are really critical considerations for any of these processes. 
All right. Well, I think that covers it for the moment. So we can yield back a few minutes to everyone's day. And thank you very much. And thank you, Benson. I would just note there um, in the slide deck, um, there are some additional resources there that if folks have questions, a couple of articles that we've written um, relevant to um, strategic risk and also specifically, I think, addressing many of the points we've made here, but um, was recently published in a Governance Institute uh, publication on moving beyond conflict to arrive at consensus. So those might be good resources for boards or management teams uh, and maybe start some discussions uh, in your community. So thank you very much for your time and joining us today. Uh, Claire and I both really, really appreciate your, your participation. Thank you.